OK, um, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for taking time out of your busy day to uh, attend. Uh, I can't remember what number lecture this is now, Tim, for the fifth fifth lecture. Yeah. So um, we're um, really, really pleased to have you here, but especially pleased um, to present our guest, which I'll do shortly. Um, really good to see so many of our future nurses and I don't know if there'll be future midwives in there because I don't know whether we've got the student midwives. But I think there's and to people from UHSM as well, put your hands up, go on. I said, yay. So really pleased to see people here because I think this is a, is a, a really, these are really, really good lectures and um, they do generate a degree of uh, thinking and discussion. And it's always a shame that we can't do it, um, uh, you know, regular, even more regular than we do it. And we have previously, I think, filmed some, haven't we, that have been quite useful because then people can look, that, look at them uh, in their own time. But... Um, Anyway, welcome, all of you. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cheryl Lenny, I'm the Chief Nurse. Um, and today we're introducing, it's Dr. Francis Healy, isn't it? It's Francis, Dr. Francis Healy. Now, Francis is our keynote speaker today, and she's, um, she, I'm sure she's going to be very humble and self-effacing, but actually, Francis um, is a registered general nurse, and she's also a mental health nurse. Her doctorate is in um, hospital force prevention, and I can't think of there being anybody in here who doesn't think that's a subject they'd like to know a little bit more about. And if somebody's got a bit more information, evidence um, to support any of our practice, then um, we want to hear about it. So I think it, we're really looking forward to that, Francis. Um, in, in addition to that, Francis has designed and led successful randomised controlled trials. And I think there'll be people here, particularly with their research heads on, who'll be thinking they might want to be asking Francis some questions at the end of this session about some of the work that she's done because I know that um, the, um, we've got so many, we're really fortunate here in Manchester that we've got so many postdoctoral and doctoral and um, ambitious nurses aiming to complete doctorates um, in our organisation and that is actually quite unusual across the health service so you know it is um, something we should rightly be proud of. She's also um, worked a lot with uh, regional quality improvement projects. She's got a range of responsibilities relating to improving the quality of investigation and learning organised from patient safety incidents. And for the past 12 years, um, so it shows a staying power, she's worked with national organisations with responsibilities for patient safety. And she's currently the head of patient safety insight at NHS England um, in Dr. Mike Durkin's leadership team. And we were just very briefly having a conversation there saying how nurse staffing got moved to the patient safety team and led by a doctor so that was um, it's been an interesting opportunity for Francis because um, not many nurses we don't really like somebody else telling us how we should work and what our staffing levels should be should do it so that you know might be something you want to ask Francis about as well so currently she's working um, with Mike and her, her responsibilities there include providing expertise within NHS England and partner organisations on the measurement of and assurance of patient safety, oversight of clinical reviews um, of all nationally reported death and severe harm incidents um, and the NHS England patient safety alerting system and work streams on safe staffing. So her recent publication is Preventing Falls in the Hospital Tackling Risk Factors Should Be a Clinical Priority. And I, I think those of you who've been working, and I can see our falls experts in here, um, on looking around um, enhanced supervision and one-to-one -one support, I'm sure if you haven't got a question by the end of this, I certainly will have. So I'm hoping that you've got plenty of questions ready for Francis. So anyway, enough from me. I'm just delighted to introduce Francis to you. Welcome. Oh dear me, that's, that's built me up a bit there, hasn't it? But I will do my best. Um, and just to defend poor Dr. Mike Durkin, uh, yeah, he, he was extremely careful not to tread on nurses' territory in terms of nurse staffing, uh, but very much saw his role as adding the multidisciplinary element, which is certainly what I'll try to do talking about falls today. I will just note that when this lecture was advertised, someone missed off the question mark. Um, so I'm, I'm not absolutely sure whether it's trickier than running a nuclear power station, but um, you can leave that to your judgment at the end of uh, this session. So um, 
My mother was a thwarted nurse. She would have been a nurse probationer about the time the NHS was being born, but unfortunately her father, my grandfather, broke his leg and spent a week on an orthopaedic ward. And he came out saying that the student nurses were treated worse than slaves and spoken to like they were lower than worms. And no daughter of his was doing that for a living. Uh, so she went off to be a post office clerk, but like all good mothers, uh, tried to uh, transfer her ambitions to the next generation. So from the age of four, my only dressing up outfit was nurse's uniform. And my bedtime reading was the Ladybird book of Florence Nightingale, uh, which I will draw from a little today. And she got a wish, and just before my 18th birthday, uh, I did become a nurse. But nursing and healthcare is a very, very broad school. You know, those of you who are just starting your careers or even halfway through them, you, there are such different routes and opportunities and journeys that your career can take you. Uh, and everything you do is a, a little bit of a culture clash. Uh, so you know, I really grew up uh, as a nurse, as a manager, um, as my first research at York Hospital and was immensely grateful to the support of, of many people who helped me do that. Uh, my first RCT really came about because we had an excellent clinical research department who helped us turn what probably would have been uh, a quality improvement project into a randomized controlled trial. Uh, and I didn't realize at the time that actually there were no other randomized controlled trials of inpatient falls prevention. So uh, from what we thought was a modest start, suddenly found people expected me to be an expert and I had to learn to be. When I joined a National Patient Safety Agency, much of what we did was trying to teach people root cause analysis. Yet that was an incredibly helpful culture to bring to falls prevention because the sense of really understanding a problem, really getting to the bottom of it, is something you can apply to much more than serious incident investigations. And you know, actually being exposed to the amount of incident data that we receive through the National Reporting and Learning System, which is your incidents. You know, if you report on a Datex or a Ulysses system locally, some kind of person in your local risk management department uploads those incidents so they can also be used for national learning and had the privilege of uh, trying to extract learning on falls on those yeah, and produce alerts for, for many topics but including some related to falls. Uh, I've also had the chance to lead pilots of national clinical audits yeah, another very, very precious tool uh, in our resources to improve care locally, and I'll certainly refer to the results of some of those. And a further part of research I've become involved in is case note review of mortality. You know, trying to understand particularly of the frail older people who, whose deaths are perhaps 50-50% you know, preventable if we're given slightly better care, not you know, the kind of black and white, we did something terrible, there was an instant death, but frail people whose chances of survival in hospital may not have been good, but one or two things or three or four things we could have done better would have made a difference and perhaps given them three months, six months, uh, another year to enjoy with their families. Yeah, and falls are sometimes a part of those stories. Uh, but they are a good reminder of just the complexity of care we need to give for frail older people in hospital. And this is Julie Windsor, who I have the privilege of having in my team, who is our National Falls Nurse Specialist. And if you ask me any really difficult questions at the end, I'm gonna give you Julie's email, because uh, Falls is no longer my entire life, um, but it is Julie's. So what I'll try and do today is not a whole evidence overview. I'll try and give you the tricky bits, the interesting bits. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about bone health at all, except to say it's obviously just as important. Uh, and I'm trying to put falls prevention in a lens of wider safety thinking that might be helpful to you in your day-to-day -day work over and above falls prevention. When you get a bit of purple print, that's going to be something where I feel you personally in the room may feel you can do something. 
Uh, so a challenge over to you to, to take some things away that perhaps you can change in your personal practice. When I went to New Zealand, I was somewhat embarrassed. They did very kindly put together all a heap of my papers and presentations that are in a public domain and put them in something called a Francis Healy Reader. Um, so though I'm embarrassed to mention it, it, it is a useful way to point people towards any further reading they might need to do. And if you Google Francis Healy Reader and spell it correctly, it will bring it to you as the first hit. Uh, if you spell Francis Healy wrong, it will bring you to the Wikipedia biography of the singer in uh, Coldplay. But um, other than that, it should work. And I'll also try and tweet some links later. The safety model I'm, I'm going to talk about falls in the context of uh, is some work recently done by Charles Vincent and Rennie Amalberti, uh, and it's called Safer Healthcare, uh, Strategies for the Real World. And the very simplistic of the gist of the argument they make over several hundred pages is we're told a lot in healthcare about following the airline safety model, following the nuclear safety model, this sense that it's incredibly safe to fly, it's incredibly safe to run a nuclear power station. And what they would say is there are some parts of healthcare where that is absolutely a good model to follow. You know, how you take a mammogram, you know, how you perform a certain specific type of surgery, actually comparing that to a cockpit or comparing that to what needs to happen in a nuclear power station is very, very helpful. And, and that's what they call an ultra-safe model. So it's a free e-book. Um, I would recommend you know, anyone who has an interest in patient safety might want to read it. It, it is readable. Um, it's theoretical, but it's theory applied to the real world. world. So that very reliable end of force prevention definitely has a place. So if you think of something like a, a good endoscopy unit, you, where they know everyone who has the procedure has had some kind of sedation, and they never let go of their elbow until they're totally sure they're steady again, um, they're alert, they're able to look after themselves, that's this sort of ultra-safe, do the same thing every time and it works model of force prevention. You know, or making sure uh, that a newly delivered mum who's had an epidural, the first time she goes to the loo, actually realises her legs might not be doing quite what they tell her to. So you always accompany the mum for that first trip out of bed. Those are ultra-safe models of one thing applied to falls prevention. The challenge is uh, we sometimes use that model too much in healthcare. Uh, and, and Charles and Rennie would say, though they're being slightly provocative, things like applying evidence-based guidelines to frail older people is actually one of the biggest risks to safety. So having in your head there is one perfect reliable way, this set way of doing things we can follow, in the wrong circumstances can be harmful rather than helpful. That's music to most geriatricians' ears, you know, the sense that, you know, there isn't a set guideline because there's such a complex mix of conditions uh, for older people coming into hospital. They won't just have a stroke, they won't just have a head injury, they won't just have delirium, they will have uh, a multiple mix of conditions. And that's where the sort of multidisciplinary, multifactorial approach to falls prevention is much more within this adaptive model than this ultra-safe, do everything the same way every time. So just to give you a little um, break from listening to me, uh, this is um, uh, a lady who, who once was a real patient, though she's been a little embellished since. Uh, can you just check, even at the back, can you read the text? Could someone in the back row nod? What I'd actually like you to do is I'm only going to give you about 90 seconds, two minutes at the most, but I want you to turn to your neighbour. Uh, you may have to shuffle seats if you're all on your lonesome. And between you, I just want you to count how many different risk factors for falls you can pull from that little story. I only want the factors you could do something about, so I, I don't want the fact that she's female or 79 because you cannot change those things, but any risk factors that you think actually someone might be able to help her with, uh, I just want you to count 
So uh, clock starts now. Turn to your neighbours and keep count of how many you can find between you. And if you're lucky enough to be sitting next to a full specialist, I expect you to win. <laughs> I'm going to stop you there. So what I'm actually ask, going to ask you all to do, because it's easier this way around, is actually I want everyone to raise their hands, and then I'm going to tell you when you can put your hand down, okay? So if everyone could raise their hands. If you found less than five risk factors, could you put your hand down? Less than seven, put your hand down. Less than ten, put your hand down. Less than 11, put your hand down. Less than, so 11. So I think we have some shared winners around or about 11. <laughs> Pretty good, isn't it? And, and we say we don't have time to do a multifactorial risk assessment. You know, you've just found 11 risk factors in 90 seconds of conversation with one peer. We'll, we'll hold that. But that's an adaptive approach. You know, it's thinking there's some list in your head, some structure you're working for, from, but you're adapting it to that individual story. There is one more part um, of their model I just want to touch on, though we won't use it much today. Uh, there's also a stage where people go ultra-adaptive, or sometimes called a heroic mode. You, know, you might need it if you're a deep-sea fisherman in a storm. You, know, you might need it if your plane's crashing on the Hudson River. You sometimes need it in healthcare. Uh, that's a picture of the earthquake at Christchurch Hospital where they both had a damaged hospital and a, a very, very um, tragically injured uh, population to try and cope with. It's a bit of a problem in healthcare because we have more heroes than heroic situations. There were some really, really... Um, silly uh, debates uh, before the Mary Seacole statue, you know, as to who should have the bigger statue, Florence Nightingale, Mary Seacole. Um, there was a very, very good letter, which I've copied here from Mary Seacole's biographer, uh, Jane Robinson, trying to pour a little bit of common sense on the situation. Uh, and what she summarised the two approaches as was Nightingale was clinical, analytical and highly professional. Seacole's approach was intuitive, holistic, demonstrably warm-hearted. Actually, Florence would probably have liked the ultra-safe model. Um, I suspect Mary might have been a bit more into the adaptive, but there's a place for both, and um, that's what we'll be trying to bring together. I'm just going to turn back a little bit to the literature. Uh, we almost have more systematic reviews of inpatient falls prevention than we have RCTs, you know, it's, it's still not a well-researched area. And, you know, you can draw slightly different conclusions in each, but this one isn't uh, unrepresentative of the rest. You know, basically the sense that multi-component, multifactorial, call them what you will, programs to prevent falls can reduce them uh, in the range of perhaps 20 to 30%. When you actually try and pull that apart and see which side of the successful or unsuccessful uh, each appear on a forest plot, it's quite a mixed picture. 
Um, these are just some of the plots from the NICE guidance, evidence, appendices. So that's always tended to be explained in terms of what actually were the interventions and who applied them. Uh, and this is drawn from uh, what was a clinical overview more than a systematic review that uh, I wrote with David Oliver and Terry Haynes, thereby making the perfect trio of geriatrician, nurse, and uh, physio. We, we just lacked the occupational therapist to uh, apologize to occupational therapists in the room. And the blue lines are the trials, uh, the components and trials that were successful. So there was something of a picture there that in the multi-component trials that worked, you tended to see them being multi-professional, having quite a few components, including things like a post fall review, medication review, something to do with toileting and, and so on. That was pretty much presented in the past as the difference between sort of responsive multi-professional and uh, you know, a more set menu of how you applied force prevention. And that is essentially true. Um, but actually, the language Charles and Rennie would use is that the ones that seem to work are in this adaptive model of how we manage risk and safety. And the ones that were slightly less successful were in this ultra-safe, there is one way of doing things and we will all do things by the book model. There's been a couple more trials since. Um, Anna Barker and colleagues six pack falls prevention trial in Australia is probably the best designed and conducted inpatient trial there has ever been. Uh, it's you know a model of how to do a trial so you really know whether the intervention worked or not as rather than whether it was actually carried out. Um, that picture of Anna not looking too great was her doing the publicity for the BMJ launch three hours before she gave birth to her second child. Um, but there's also a link to uh, an earlier conference presentation she gave of the first findings. And anyone who is looking for a research career, I would encourage them to work, watch that because it is a model of how you want to have a trial that actually shows it does not work but you use that positively to help people learn rather than try to find some faint hope in your results. You used it to say, okay, we now know what doesn't work. Um, my own trial with colleagues written up in Age and Aging was not remotely of the same design quality. It was controlled, but it wasn't a randomized controlled trial. Uh, so though we had positive results in falls prevention, you know, it can be criticized more methodologically, but it was much more a responsive, multi-professional, let's see what works for the patient approach. So these two more recent trials do tend to carry on with the evidence picture. One of the other reasons why we probably need this more adaptive approach is just the sheer scale of the problem. You know, these are the numbers of reported falls in England from acute and community hospitals. You know, very, very significant numbers. You know, we only have, in Europe, I don't know if we have 20 nuclear power stations. We only have to work out 20 ways of making them work. You know, we have six or seven million admissions of older people to hospitals and nearly a quarter of a million of those are falling in acute hospitals. So clearly one size isn't gonna fit all. And though the numbers might look smaller in older people's mental health units, and, and the patterns are slightly different, people tend to be slightly physically fitter, it's not a massively different causation. You know, the people in hospitals, as we'll see, tend to also have mental health needs. The people who fall uh, in mental health units tend to also have physical health needs. <laughs> Just one more short vi video because you know, people look at this and we look at the numbers of no harm falls. You know, I'm not really sure there is any such thing as a no harm fall. Uh, and John's story is just a little bit more about how it feels to have a fall without injury. Uh, one occasion I was, went to the toilet and uh, I was escorted there and left inside for real privacy. I got up from the toilet, went to wash my hands, and I slipped. And there's an immediate shock of landing on your back. 
And then the terrible thing was I realised I couldn't move through lack of strength. I couldn't reach the pull cords and my voice was also very weak at the time and I couldn't really shout. And gradually it dawns on you that nobody's going to come and help you. And then I was actually on a cold tile floor and I started to get cold. And that is when fear starts to strike you. You begin to think your body temperature is going down and there's no way anybody's going to contact you. And that is a very, very fearful experience. You really don't want to have that. In the end, uh, the nurse came to check on me because I hadn't reappeared in my bed. And I was found and I had to be hoisted up and all the rest of it. And checked out with brain scans in case I'd done any damage and all that sort of thing and it was quite some time that I really was beginning to get cold. It felt a long time but looking at the clock afterwards it really wasn't that many minutes and that cold feeling and fear really comes into you and eats right in. Not pleasant. Because of the previous injuries this was really a minor thing but it was because I had no memory of the previous injuries. It was actually a major thing for me. And uh, this is one of the things that I've carried from the accident, whereas the accident produced far more damage. But this is one of the things that hit me psychologically. And it's uh, still there, still there, That's over two years ago. Yeah. It was um, very lucky that we found John. Uh, I'd, I'd met him once at a conference where he was patient rep. And two years later, we were trying to find someone to tell the story of, of what it felt like to be an inpatient faller. Um, and yeah, I thought it would be hopeless trying to find him again. Uh, and he'd actually come back to volunteer in the rehabilitation unit where he'd had his rehabilitation after the, the accident. So we found him again, and he kindly filmed this. John's relatively unusual. Um, he was only in his only 70, early 70s. Most of our fallers are in their 80s and 90s. Yeah, obviously, the chart only falls off because not many people live to be 100 and, and be in hospital to fall. And the people who fall in hospitals are very frail, very unwell people. Yeah, this is uh, the typical list of, of diagnosed problems in inpatient fallers from uh, the 2012 audit. So one of the issues ha we have, if, if I'm trying to talk through the difference between an adaptive approach and being ultra safe, is we use the word falls risk assessment, but we actually mean very different things. Um, I try and just do without the word, because some people mean a risk prediction score, something with numbers uh, that tells you whether someone's high, low, or medium risk. It's a different thing from some kind of checklist prompt sheet that helps you look for those risk factors that can be modified, you know, like you were doing when you were talking about Miss A earlier. And actually, this, this numerical approach is trying to make the complex simple. It's trying to say, actually, we're not worried whether you're John, who's recovering from major trauma, or whether you're Miss A, who has something obscure going on, um, that's probably quite complicated. We're just going to score you as a number 17, and number 17s get a certain amount of interventions. Uh, whereas, you know, the risk factor approach does let you adapt, but gives you some structure as to what you're looking for. There's technical reasons why uh, we shouldn't use risk scores. They're just not bloody good at the job they're supposed to do. You know, they don't point you towards the right patients. Uh, they overpredict, they underpredict. Um, there's an awful lot of people with low scores who fall and, and high scores who don't. That is one of the reasons why NICE guidance very explicitly, and it's relatively unusual for NICE guidance to say do not, says do not use false risk prediction tools, just treat 
everyone who's ill enough to be in hospital and is an older person, either a real older person by age or an honorary older person because they have all the ill health of someone older, um, as though they're at risk of falls. So the challenge I, I would give you, you know, if you're working in an environment where scores are still in use, do question it. Uh, if you've got colleagues in other hospitals where they're still in use, help them question it. People feel a bit lost, though, if they've had a risk score and it's taken away. Uh, they're saying, well, who then do I give my interventions to? And just a, a, a mental model, it can help to think backwards. So, you know, who would you want to give safe footwear to? Who would you want to give a medication review? Who would need a walking aid in reach? And if you think of it that way, it becomes a bit more straightforward. You know, you don't need a risk score to hand out your safe footwear. You just need to look at what's on their feet. Uh, you don't need to uh, you know, necessarily have a falls risk score to know who needs a medication review. You need to look at the drug chart. And these are the issues that NICE guidance says we ought to be thinking of. Uh, I won't stay on the screen for long. We'll, we'll pick some of those out later. <laughs> You won't be able to read the small print on this screen. You just need to look at the difference between the pale green and the dark green. This was in the most recent national audit in 2015. Green is what policies in hospitals said they ought to do. Green is what they actually did if you looked at the patient's case notes. And you can see there's a lot more pale green than, than dark green. You know, our real problem is not so much our policies. Our policies aren't perfect, but our implementation of our policies. One of those is core balance sight and in reach. And you can see there it reaches just over 80%. Now, any not applicable patients have been taken off this chart. So this is about patients who could use a core bell. About one in five didn't have it in reach. Now, that's a place where we have no excuse except to be like nuclear industry. You know, we can remember to put our seatbelt on every time we're in a car. You know, we've somehow got to have good systems for remembering to put that call bell back that's just as automatic and, and just as non-negotiable as putting on your seatbelt in a car or a taxi. But getting the call bell in reach is just the start of the story. Uh, I suspect many people in the room will know Kate Granger from Hello My Name Is. Um, it, it's very sad to talk about Kate at the minute because although Kate started tweeting uh, to help us understand what it was like to be dying, she actually did so well um, for two or three years that I think most people who follow her kind of hoped Kate wouldn't die. You know, Kate is now in a hospice and Kate has always reminded us she is dying. Apart from Hello My Name Is, she said some very profound things about the call buzzer. Yeah, the small print there uh, is the start of one of her blogs on this. Um, but she explains why she doesn't ring the call bell in hospital. You know, it makes her feel like a patient. She worries um, that it's a burden on staff. And she gets a feeling staff disapprove of patients who buzz too often. And she gave actually examples of, of why that's the case. Just once in her first illness, if she got a bad reaction from staff, and what she says is she feels that condition her not to be a buzzer. Uh, and sadly, examples again in, in later hospitalizations, the small print there says, wake up to her, her IV drip playing up, very tired, so I press bell, scowling uh, staff member with no name, how long has it been like that for? I think this is a little bit like nuclear industry too. Um, when Fukushima exploded, you know, Germany shut down its entire nuclear program. You, you actually only need to get something wrong once, and it can have a terrible impact on what people believe and what will happen the rest of the time. Uh, so there's an awful challenge for us there. You know, on the worst of our working days, when we've got a patient who is ringing for the umpteenth time, we only have to look cross and irritable once. Uh, and we will stop them ringing another 99 times when they probably should, or the patient opposite who watches that. One aspect here uh, is assessment for medications. 
Again, I'm only going to spin through the slides because all of this is easily available in any of the reviews. But medication is an incredibly important risk factor for falling in hospital and for being injured in a fall in hospital. And almost um, the only uni intervention studies that might work in hospital are taking away medication uh, that um, can, can cause more harm than good. It's a difficult aspect, you know, there's certainly some very easy, common drugs to learn to look out for. Uh, what I would challenge you to go away and do is, on the Forsafe website, you can download a sheet that helps you find some of the red, orange, yellow and green drugs most implicated in falls risk. Uh, there's e-learning packages for nurses and for doctors, and actually the doctor's one is, you know, perfectly accessible. Try both if you like one um, that will help you learn more about medication and falls risk. Uh, and my challenge to you would be, you know, either learn or if you already know all of this, if, if you're the pharmacist in the room or the falls specialist, you know, go away and commit to teach someone to recognize one or two of the key drugs implicated in falls risk. But do it nicely. My Ladybird book told me that um, Florence's way of negotiating with the bad Dr. Hall, who was thwarting her efforts to improve the hospital, was to get a letter from the Queen and wave it at him. Uh, nurses do have an incredible influence on what doctors prescribe for good and for ill. Um, there is no doubt um, what we say or hint at or imply does affect what they prescribe. Um, so be the nice Florence, make friends with your doctors, especially the new juniors that have recently come into their first placements, uh, and encourage them to, to de-prescribe when it's in the patient's interest. Assessing for the presence of delirium was something else that was not well done in the national audit. You know, down in about 35% of patients who should have been assessed were assessed. Yeah, and we all know the obvious reasons why, first of all, dementia or, or other forms of cognitive impairment would affect falls risk, but it's not only about uh, their ability to recognize hazards and their own limitations. You know, dementia is a neurological condition. It, it affects their walking patterns. They're much more liable to have a postural drop in their blood pressure. Reflexes are more poor if they try and save themselves mid-fall, and they're much more likely to be a prescribed, unfortunately, and much more likely to be affected by sedative medication. And of course, they're very susceptible to delirium. But it's much more of a risk if no one notices how impaired a patient's cognition is. Um, I'm just going to ask for a little vote here. You're going to be allowed to put your hand up for one of the three. Who do you think is best at spotting confusion? Uh, I'm going to call in a minute, and you can vote for either doctors, nurses, or therapists. Okay, so doctors, if you vote for doctors, hands up now. Uh-oh. <laughs> Nurses, hands up now. Quite a lot of the room. Therapists, hands up now. I think we're fairly nicely split. If we allow for the fact we've got more nurses in the room and we're always a bit parochial, I think we'll call that <laughs> evens. So, you know, I have a little bit of research here to reinforce your prejudices, I'm afraid, then. Uh, lovely little study. Uh, someone very clever who was a doctor uh, realized most doctors don't actually do the abbreviated mental test score. They, they think they have psychic powers. So without actually asking the patients those questions, they know what the answers are. And they devised a little study that would test this. Now, unsurprisingly, you know, you can tell if someone is totally with it or really does not know where they are. You know, that's something doctors weren't bad at guessing. But overall, they got it wrong three quarters almost of the time. Uh, and one third of the time, they got it very wrong. Uh, they either underdiagnosed or overdiagnosed. But uh, I'm afraid nurses have to plead guilty too. Uh, I, I regret I never published this, but when we were trying to make the case for uh, an older person's liaison psychiatry team, we had to assess how many patients in our hospital had cognitive impairment. 
And we just had this little clever thought that before we went off and did the AMTSs, we'd ask the nurses if they had anyone who was confused. Uh, it didn't go terribly well. For, for every one with a score of less than six out of ten, uh, every, every three of those, only one was known to their nurses as confused. And one lady we found actually scored zero. Now, to score zero, you don't know where you are, when you are, or even really who you are. Um, but she was socially compliant, smiled sweetly, and was deaf. And so everyone assumed she actually knew what she was doing. I'm afraid I have no study on therapists. So for, as far as we know, you are perfect at this. Um, <laughs> the issue we have now, uh, because of the push to uh, diagnose dementia, doctors are doing these very consistently, but I'm doubtful we're always sharing them. You know, so it appears in the notes, but do the nurses, do the healthcare assistants actually know what score the doctor came up with? Uh, and let's hope he, actually, he or she actually asked the 10 questions. So my challenge to you is that almost certainly is being collected for your patients. How much is it shared at handovers at ward realms so everyone knows if someone does have a cognitive impairment? It's a, a complicated graph here, and I, I won't go through all of it, but uh, it's a nice little model that basically says, if you have dementia, it only takes the tiniest thing to tip you into delirium, whereas if you or me uh, were uh, to have delirium, it would be because of a major uh, catastrophe, you know, meningitis or, or something like that. Very good, nice guidance on delirium. Um, in the Full Safe project, we try to teach nurses quite a, a complex distinction between delirium and dementia. I'm not sure that worked very well. Uh, and it's probably down to just trying to have in people's minds some much simpler differences. You know, first really knowing if someone is confused by using an objective assessment and knowing if they've changed. The key factor about delirium is yesterday is different to today, tomorrow is different to yesterday. And for people to know that you don't have to be agitated to be delirious, you know, knowing there is such a thing as apathetic delirium. And the one cardinal sign, it's, if you haven't got it, doesn't mean you don't have delirium, but if you are doing this, you almost certainly have delirium, is cotton picking motions someone seeming to find invisible things in the bedclothes, once seen, very easily taught, very easily remembered. We're very good, happily, these days at saying, could it be sepsis? You know, my challenge is to you, can we almost as often say, could it be delirium? Because actually, in hospital patients, it's much more common even than sepsis. And delirium treatment is pretty much force prevention, and force prevention is pretty much delirium treatment. So there's a real uh, gains there. If you can make people more delirium aware, uh, you will also win for force prevention. And uh, these summaries um, can be found quite easily, either by looking up uh, the interestingly spelt NUA, who, who's done most of the research literature on delirium, or looking at the NICE delirium clinical guidelines. So the people who fall in hospital you know, really are this population who uh, are known to be cognitively impaired and often have delirium on top of that. So one small challenge to those of you in the room who are writing policy, typically the policies I see are written for a cooperative, uh, cognitively intact older patient and then has a PS, but if they're cognitively impaired, we do this instead. It actually needs to be the other way around. You know, the majority of uh, force prevention in hospitals has to be about the cognitively impaired patient or the one with delirium, and it can add a PS of the extra things you can do if uh, they're lucky enough to be cognitively intact. One more thing, uh, measurements of lying and standing blood pressure done terribly uh, in the inpatient force audit. Uh, we do have some insights on why it's so badly done. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm just going to ask you to vote in a minute. If you were given the choice and you had to take uh, blood pressure, which would you choose? A, a nice manual sphygmometer 
or a Dynamap or equivalent. So votes for manual sphygmometer. Okay, votes for Dynamap. Okay, so at least we have some good old fashioned souls like me in the room who uh, still like their equipment less technical. The problem with lying and standing blood pressure is you cannot take it on a Dynamap. Essentially, if you have a bad postural drop, the Dynamap thinks it has a mechanical failure and it carries on taking it till you have a normal blood pressure. So there is no point trying to assess lying and standing blood pressure uh, with uh, an automated blood pressure machine. When we try to uh, get people taking lying and standing blood pressures in full safe, we really had to go back to the beginning. We found there were units with no manual sphygmometers, no stethoscopes. Uh, and we also had to buy training stethoscopes because you, you need those things to teach people how to do it. Uh, we found we had early warning scores that actually had no place to write down a lying and standing blood pressure. Uh, and we found we had units that had no one who could use uh, a manual sphygmometer, literally no one. So we had to send people in to teach someone to teach other people. Uh, and we also had to issue guidance for doctors so that if we did find a postural drop, the medical staff understood what the response to that would be in terms of reducing the risk to the patient uh, falling because the blood pressure was in their boots. So the challenge to you, those of you um, who are comfortable with manual sphygmometers, who know how to take uh, a technically correct lying and standing blood pressure, you know, tomorrow, next shift, teach somebody, teach a student, teach a colleague, uh, share the skills. Um, and if not, find someone who can teach you, even if you have to borrow someone from another unit. And if you don't have your sphygmometers and stethoscopes you need, my ladybird book told me that, that Florence actually raided the stores. You know, she wrestled the key out of Dr. Hall's hands because he was hiding the bandages. Um, I'm told actually one of the things she wrestled out the stores, if you, if you look not in Ladybird but in some of the more authentic literature, was 500 bottles of port. <laughs> So, you know, in hindsight, I can understand why Dr. Hall might have been slightly upset. Uh, but if you don't have the basic equipment you need to take uh, a fundamental check for falls risk, like lying and standing blood pressure, be as assertive as Florence and, and try and insist you get it. We know we're cash trapped, but yeah, that's still an important piece of kit. Continence assessment, clearly important, and I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, you will have brilliant access to continence nurse specialist. You know, I'm sure you have whole policies on that. Uh, I'm just going to talk about some of the, the challenges uh, of managing falls in a toilet. Nationally, it feels like about 15% of falls occur in the toilet. That doesn't sound very much, um, but I just want you to have a little quick think. In terms of minutes, um, just think in your head for a minute. Uh, an average patient, one without severe constipation, how long do you think they might spend within the toilet in a day? Just let you calculate to yourself for a minute or two. Did anyone have about 30 minutes? Less than 30 minutes? More than 30 minutes? Yeah. Just, just to do the maths for you, 15% of 24 hours is about three and a half hours. So, you know, certainly the time people spend in toilets is vastly less than the proportion of falls we get in toilets. You know, it's a very high risk time, even though, you know, 15% might not sound like a vast proportion of falls. So we have this issue, don't we, of privacy and dignity or, or safety first. Now the ultra safe model, and, and I do see this in some American hospital policies, is nobody is allowed to go to the toilet on their own. Uh, the adaptive would be, well, it depends. Uh, Florence and Mary were, were Victorian ladies. You know, I'm not sure they would have seen themselves naked, let alone ever had anyone else see them naked. Who knows? <laughs> I, I was gifted with uh, two very contrasting grandmothers. Uh, I had a Salvation Army grandmother, 
Uh, those who don't know Salvation Army, uh, you still wear a kind of Victorian uniform uh, to go to Citadel. Uh, and you don't smoke, you don't drink. Uh, I never saw my Salvation Army grandmother's knees because even in summer she wore thick, wrinkled, woolly tights. Uh, my Irish Catholic grandmother never thought needing the loo in the middle of a family celebration should involve interrupting the conversation, um, and therefore the door was rarely shut, so she didn't feel that she actually missed anything <laughs> while she had a pee. Uh, and I do think we're entering a, an interesting era. Uh, my godmother was at Isle of Wight Festival 1969, and she has just turned 75. We're going to have such an interesting time in geriatrics when the hippie chicks uh, and that generation are becoming our older people. Now, you know, it's really quite simple. You know, when someone's cognitively intact, just ask them what they prefer. But our attitudes to things like privacy are lifelong. You know, of my two grandmothers, now deceased, and my godmother, if ever they were not able to answer for themselves, family would be able to tell you perfectly well what their attitudes to privacy uh, and uh, wishes when they're using the toilet would be. Appropriate mobility aid in reach. We didn't do terribly well on this either, and this again is only about people who needed and could use a mobility aid. There were plenty of get outs in the order if you shouldn't have it on, in reach because you shouldn't walk alone. Yeah, that's uh, in the region of about 60% of the time. Yeah, that's like the call bell, you know, we really have no excuse for not trying the nuclear industry approach there. You know, if someone needs their walking frame in reach, it, it should be. Uh, and Florence certainly believed in the merits of early rehabilitation. Um, she also managed to get some fresh vegetables out of it. Uh, we understand that they had to garden. Um, that was their physiotherapy. There are some studies that say we are dreadful at encouraging mobility in hospital. Uh, two studies there. Yeah, mobile pre-discharge older patients who could walk walked less than 20 steps at a time and this wasn't because they couldn't it was about lack of opportunity to mobilize so sometimes what we do in falls uh, I'm sure no one in the room would do there are downsides I overheard this from from a ward sister at a conference next to a stand selling these alarms uh, one of the things we saw in instant reports in response to falls was an ultra-low bed used to stop someone walking. And um, also a quote uh, from someone presenting their intentional rounding study. Bit of a problem because, you know, those of us in the room know the less you use it, the more you lose your muscle strength, your ability to mobilize safely. We actually got very good at doing it to nuclear industry standards for someone who's had a hip fracture. You know, they will be up and mobilize the day after surgery, if not the day of surgery. There's something about us needing to spread that to medical patients, I think, and, and that's a thought I'd leave with you. If we can do it post-surgery, we can do it. We can do it for all our patients. And 24-hour services is a contentious issue, you know, we should never have a service for service sake, um, but there are differences. And these are figures from one of the original national audits which said if you didn't bring your walking frame in with you and you were mobile and you needed it, there was only one third of hospitals could have got you a walking frame at the weekend if you'd come in on a Friday, which isn't um, acceptable. And we know our multidisciplinary teams shrink at the weekend. You know, there are fewer physios, fewer OTs. And yeah, it's not possible to work miracles, but it's sometimes easier to sort it out at a ward level than it is as a whole hospital. So that's a conversation perhaps to go away and have. You know, is there something in your ward and unit you can do just to keep a little bit more uh, mobilization and therapy going at weekends? Visual assessment, it is important because the kind of inpatients we have, the older, frail inpatients who are housebound and stopped going to the optician, 
Uh, certainly, though there's no good recent studies, there are suggestions they have very high levels of visual impairment, and we're not good at even doing basic checks of vision. Test one I'll recommend to you is if their frames of their glasses look very old-fashioned, odds on the lenses are at least as old as the frames. So if they look 10 years behind the times, you know, assume they may, long, may no longer be good for their vision. There are some simple tests you can do. They're blindness tests, not vision tests. You know, holding up, this is called nurse's pocket. You will have a key, a pen, and scissors in your pocket. If someone can tell the difference between those a bed length away, they can at least see their own feet. Yeah, even counting fingers is okay, but be careful how you do it when you get to number two. Uh, and Julie, the falls nurse specialist in our team, is working with the Royal College of Ophthalmologists to try and find a slightly more scientific but simple bedside test for vision problems that, uh, when it's agreed, we'll be able to share. Environmental hazards. Um, I, I love the way Florence is directing the other nurses to do the dirty work. She's, she's not actually getting her hands dirty herself. Um, but they seem to be missing you know, that key falls prevention ingredient we do when we mop our floors. There are other environmental hazards, and these are the key areas nice guidance say we should look at. Flooring, lighting, furniture, and fittings such as handholds just have my little black gallery of toilets to show you. Look at the call bell. That's going to be really useful if you're on the toilet or the floor, isn't it? Look at the toilet roll, or, or rather don't. If you're sitting on the toilet, you, you're going to have to make a very strange maneuver if you can even remember it's there. Uh, this is a lethal one. Uh, see this wonderfully shaped shelf just in the right place to gouge a small part out of your forehead if you stumble. And to ensure you do stumble, there's a waste bin for your paper towel that requires you to lift one foot uh, to open it just at the place where, if you lose your balance, that shelf is waiting for you. Modern toilets are sometimes better. This is great. This one realises that men pee standing up and it's actually given them a handheld hold in the right place. There's nice visual distinction for sitting down between the wall and the toilet. Um, but where's the loo roll? Uh, and where's the call bell? They, they probably are there somewhere, but they're not going to be very obvious to a frail older person. And my bête noire, you know, I think that's probably implicated in more hospital falls than any other piece of equipment. We put it over their feet in a perfect way to trip them up. Uh, you know, and some of the design that's actually perfectly decent is confusing for people with cognitive impairment, strokes as well as dementias. Your checkered floors start to look like steps. Uh, you know, anyone working with people with dementia will notice that bits of blue or green floor cause them to hesitate. You know, it triggers something that looks like water to them. Yeah, and we don't do well as we get older. Uh, even older, as in 50s, going from bright light to dim light. So that brightly lit toilet at night with its fluorescent strip, and then you have to walk out into a dimly lit ward, is actually much more dangerous than more gentle, graduated differences between bright and dark. Anything we can do to make an environment dementia-friendly obviously helps. Great materials from the King's Fund there. But just in terms of basics, you know, if you have an occupational therapist linked to your ward, you know, can you get them to look at your ward the way they would look at a patient's home? Sometimes that can give you real insights for small things that could be changed without major budgets. You know, and if you need new tables, overbeds, lockers, don't just buy what you had before. You know, have a think and see if we can find something more falls friendly. Think about five minutes and be done. I, I know I'm slightly over, but uh, we're still okay on that, Tim. <coughs> nightingale wards. Uh, I don't think I ever nursed anyone on a nightingale ward. It obviously depended where you were in the country, whether you had that opportunity. Um, I did uh, manage uh, an area where a lot of the nurses had recently moved from an old hospital that had nightingale wards and there would always be a cry of oh you could see them so much better on the nightingale wards 
You know, and of course we have to make special in part of a wider picture, whether we're cohort nursing, whether we're observing people more frequently. Uh, but my one challenge for you, you know, even though there can be hospital-wide programs to help people do special observation better, you know, give more diversional materials, you, you personally can make a difference by making anyone who's doing that job feel a bit loved, feel a bit part of the team, make sure they understand you know, how what they're doing is, is really important and give them breaks. Nearly there, three slides on after a fall and, and we'll be done. I couldn't find much on Florence doing falls aftercare, uh, only bandaging her dolls and um, some poor shepherd's injured uh, collie. But there are some significant injuries that happen after hospital patients fall. Taking together National Hip Fracture Database, which counts inpatient fractures, uh, and what's reported to us, probably about 4,000. The majority of those are fractured hip, and that's actually something about how frail our patients are. You know, the minor injuries happen in people who are active enough to put out a hand to save themselves. Yet our patients tend to be so sick, they land directly, uh, and if it's a fracture, it's the most serious kind. We issued guidance on uh, aftercare after a fall and, and NICE reinforced it with a quality standard because it wasn't being got right. You know, most falls in hospital don't cause injury and we get a bit inured to the possibility that there will be one. And we're still sadly getting it wrong. This is a relatively recent incident report just from last year. Uh, she's walking, she's fallen. It's obvious to the nurses this is a hip fracture. It's shortened, it's rotated. She's probably also got a collis fracture. Um, problems with the hoist. Um, that sounds just like the ordinary ward hoist, which probably isn't the ideal one to be using with a hip fracture anyway. Rolled onto shoe sheets and lifted safely onto bed. Yeah, imagine how that feels when you've actually still got two raw edges of bone left together. When we look at these incidents, I honestly think the thing that makes nurses rush is we feel awful. There's our patient in pain on the floor, quite often visible to our colleagues, visitors, other patients, and perhaps we rush into taking steps to get out of that situation when we could pause and think. Uh, so the ask there is, if you're ever in that situation, it doesn't hurt to take a minute or two to think. You know, once someone's on the floor, Damage has been done, let's just not add to it. Florence was, of course, um, people would tell you, the inventor of the pie chart. Only it's not a pie chart and someone else invented the pie chart, but leaving that aside, she was very good at um, displaying statistics. Measuring falls is important, this isn't how you do it. Uh, and we do a lot of things that are wrong. The reason I actually got a career in force prevention was I had a medical dementia unit, so my directorate manager was always saying, why the hell did I have more falls than the EMT ward? Um, we really shouldn't compare different specialities. You know, it's not telling us anything about quality, it's telling us about the patients. And we've got to be a bit careful what we do with anything. Um, these two wards look the same that month. Look. Then the black ward's ahead of the red ward. Then the red ward's ahead of the black ward. That's what random events do. That doesn't mean they've got better or worse. It means they're small numbers and they will jump about a bit before you can see trends. Uh, this um, is a figure I'm privy to because we have a national reporting and learning system. Uh, and it's still being talked about in conferences as a wonderful falls prevention initiative. Uh, actually, they introduced an electronic reporting system and forgot to give people logins, so forms <laughs> went unreported for a while. Uh, this is another one whereby, um, this looks very impressive, um, but the first point is actually one patient on one ward. Um, so some charts can look very interesting, um, but perhaps not be quite as good as they seem. There are clever ways to present falls that runs, rolls some of that out. Um, there's more reading to link to if you wish to do that. But the most important thing is reported falls are not all falls. Anyone who believes every single fall gets reported is kidding themselves. Um, so it's important to periodically measure what's missing. 
Uh, and this was, you know, how we measured the results of fall safe. We had to rely on reported falls, but whilst reported falls fell, we also knew that staff were reporting better from periodic surveys. Their confidence they'd reported the last fall they'd seen increased at the same time as reported falls fell. So my challenge is to you, just never um, allow a chart of, of reported falls to be described as falls. If it's come from an incident reporting system, call them what they are. Uh, and just to reinforce that, last week National Quality Board uh, Safe Staffing Guidance encourages uh, trust to use falls as a multidisciplinary indicator. Um, but also insists you need to assess local levels of underreporting, so you know what's missing as well as what you've got. The one difference between hospitals and pilots and power stations is when they save lives, it's visible, they're lauded. It's Chelsea Sullenberg who, who saved the patients in the Hudson Bay crash. It's the uh, people who went into the nuclear plant in Japan uh, to try and prevent that being even worse. They're heroes. Um, but you're heroes. There will be someone you have prevented from having a fall who has an 80th, 90th or 100th birthday with their families and you will never know their name and they will never know yours. But something you did uh, made that happen. Uh, and just to finish in the Florence versus Mary war, yeah, we need to be both, of course, uh, and Jane Robinson expresses that very well. And um, it's true for all healthcare practice, but hopefully particularly for false prevention. So I apologise for running over time, but thank you very much. Francis, thanks for that. That was absolutely brilliant, and it was really good, I think, you know, when we're thinking of the work we're doing at the moment, particular emphasis we've got on um, trying to reduce our specials because you'll know nationally the cost of one-to-one uh, -one nursing has gone through the roof. Um, and uh, add that to changes in supply and nursing, safer staffing levels, um, the fact that there's a, a link to uh, high use of temporary staff with incidents and falls as well, you kind of end up, you know, you deciding which bit are you chasing to actually uh, fix the problem. And I think we have agreed in some of the work that we're doing that, that we've got to, somehow we've got to get this falls prevention and managing the risk of falls and one-to-one -one nursing right. And I think there was some really interesting um, sort of parallels to take you, and though it was a comedy sketch, because um, I don't know, um, uh, unlike Francis, I have worked in a Nightingale ward, so probably a lot older than Francis then. And, um, but actually, one of the good things about the Nightingale ward wasn't necessarily the length of the ward, but it was that you not only could see everybody, but the patients looked out for each other in the next bed. So they'd tell you that they'd say, you know, Eric's nurse, Eric's getting out of bed, you know, and because they just look at the, the guys were better at it, by the way, than the ladies. Um, but the men used to particularly, I find, that look out for each other and tell you what was going on. And that doesn't mean to say they didn't fall. There was a lot of things we did wrong in those days, and uh, from a nursing perspective. Um, but I think there are lots of issues there about how we look at one of the things I think stands out my, at the moment in the work that we're looking at around one-to-one um, uh, -one specials is that we're very risk averse. So thinking about your model there is um, nurses are very, get very worried that if they don't um, arrange for someone to stay with the patient sort of 24 seven, that actually they'll get in trouble if the patient falls because it'll be their fault because they didn't get somebody in to come and sit with them. So, and a bit of that blame culture, you know, and actually we just need to make, sometimes we have to make professional judgments and sometimes we won't always get it right. And something I'll be interested in shortly when I've sort of asked over to you for questions is um, um, the, the use of families and carers. And I've been talking to Sue just in the last sort of 24 hours about, you know, we, we say we're open to visitors and we've got a, a, a more open culture but actually if you are cognitively impaired perhaps it isn't a nurse or a stranger that you need next to you over during particularly during the night it's somebody whose voice you would recognize if you woke up and uh, were confused and that's all you need uh, to prevent you from getting out of bed for
and etc. So lots of interesting things there that just not just about falls. And I think what's really interesting to sort of just thinking of that in the kind of really much more multi-professional and a holistic way that we care for patients. In this case, in the hospital, but many of you from the community will recognise the similarities as well. So questions then over to you, Francis. Hopefully, we'll get some questions. Could you say who you are when you ask answer a question? And the first brave soul, the others will follow quickly. So um, some questions from yourselves. Thank you for a really interesting talk, um, really helpful. Um, my name is Anne Comerford, I'm an advanced nurse practitioner in care of older people. And I just w wondered if you'd come across any research linking caffeine use to falls, prevention falls reduction, because there's been some anecdotal evidence on uh, locally that perhaps this could be a factor if we remove caffeine from drinks, that this might have a positive effect. I I've never heard of that, but it sounds a re really interesting idea. Okay, um, thank you. And it's just worth mentioning some of that work because um, we've looked at it, haven't we? In yes. And actually, we're now getting people writing to us saying, mm -hmm. you didn't offer us caffeine-free drinks and that might have stopped my mum from falling. Mm -hmm. So it is something mm -hmm. that's in the kind of public mm -hmm. arena, isn't it, that people generally think in. Because the idea is that it prevents bladder irritation as well, therefore people don't need to go mm -hmm. to the toilet. So often as well, isn't I, it? So. I, I mean, certainly, as you'll be well aware, the sort of link between toileting patterns and falling yes. are high, so there's a logical link there. But maybe it's one, you know, to, to no, see whether the researchers in the room yes. can think of a way of testing it a bit more. Okay. Thank you. Unfortunately, don't have any results, but anecdotally, yeah. I'm seeing less falls at night. Yeah. I think the, a challenge there, though, for you, Nikki, and I think Francis doesn't give it, I definitely will give it you, is we're very good at doing like that audit type work, and we're very good at going, oh, let's have a look at that. And so, and people here from Trafford, where we've looked at introducing John's campaign uh, for open visiting, and, and then we've gone, oh, yeah, uh, complaints or falls or whatever, they reduced. But there's actually no evidence of that other than the anecdotal stuff and some measures. And mm. I think one of the things that getting some inspiration for someone like Francis is how are you, you know, how do we challenge you guys to think actually there's a piece of that why mm. you were asked about why you had so many falls, mm. picking up that's the beginning of somebody's research career, you know, really picking up some of this and thinking, well, actually, I think it's a, a good um, start somewhere that's something that you can really get look yeah. into. Yeah. And I think one of the things is to actually test it, you need to scale up because, you know, happily your numbers are so small on one ward. So I guess you're testing, are people happy and it doesn't do any harm? And that's a really good first step to maybe work with your research colleagues for something on a bigger scale. Yeah. Excellent. Sarah? Thank you. Thank you. A really great lecture. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. Just a question about um, sort of the mobilising of patients. I'm, I do get a bit anxious about this, and I heard someone speak at the conference last week saying that sitting is the new smoking, which I like that as a line. And I wonder whether we are trying to stop people moving a lot. That special kind of well, they didn't do it there too much, but I do people see see people saying sit down, sit down. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's a balance that I'm not sure we're getting right. And I wonder, is there? A, I know there is some stuff around safe falling, but we're going to have to accept some falling because we want people to get up and mobilise. Is there much stuff that you know about, about, I don't know, ways that we can get people to fall more safely, or is there research or new products coming out that will allow people to be padded? Or I'm constantly thinking there must be a way you can have, you know, one of those inflatable helmets that kind of comes up. Is there one we can have around people's hips or something? Because I don't want people to stop moving, mm. and so we've kind of got to balance it. I think certainly, you know, there's there's research interest in that. You know, Chris again might want to take some of these questions. The hip protectors, as people will know, really didn't work, even though actually technologically they were quite good at reducing the impact. You know, and I think there's a sort of story there as in how much is actually the impact, how much is just falling awkwardly. Um, but in terms of risks and benefits, you know, the, the actual detrimental effects of being old and frail, 
you know, and staying in bed for even a day or two longer than you need to or walking less are so well known and actually are well researched. You know, the, the risk of falls is relatively light against that, but people's way of thinking about it is, of course, the fall is visible, the other harms aren't. You know, and that's a little bit like GPs struggle to treat atrial fibrillation. They kind of know the research says, put people on warfarin, they won't die of the stroke but the stroke they don't die of isn't visible, whereas the one in 100 bleed is. And I think we're a little bit like that with mobility and falls, you know, that the benefits of early mobilization are the invisible successes and the falls are the, the sad occasional failures, but we only see one. Thank you, that was brilliant. Um, I'm Helen Hurst, I'm an advanced nurse practitioner in renal medicine and I might come and pick your brains afterwards about a project we're doing on open visiting. But I was interested in the line and standing blood pressure comment um, because we're quite obsessed with it in renal yeah. and I'm, a, I'm not a Dynamat fan, but I don't think that message, I was just interested in the audience about Dynamaps and line and standing blood pressures. Do people? use a Dynamap for line and standing blood pressure? How many of you use Dynamap for line and standing blood pressures? You're just not the I, I just not don't think that... Now, you think the only well, one. I just think that message isn't out there quite mm. so well. I think a lot of nurses use Dynamaps for, for line and standing blood pressures. I know we do in, mm. in renal medicine. Oh, right, that's mm. okay. I think it's a really important message, yeah. that's all. So. And I do think actually renal units can see it. You visibly see the change in your patient's blood pressure during treatment, don't you, and how it affects their, yeah. their dizziness, their well-being. Yeah, so, so, you know, to you, it's, it's visible in minutes, and we've got to make it more visible to other people, I think. I, could I talk to you afterwards? Everybody else got any questions over here? Hi, I'm Trish Richardson, Falls Nurse, and Sally Falls Lead. We're from Pennine Acute Trust, and I worked at Withenshaw for quite a few years as well. Um, we, we seem to be seeing a lot of patients on the wards where, say, the phones are ringing, um, and nobody else answers them apart from the nurses. And I just feel, we feel there's, there's a lot of um, room for multidisciplinary involvement and responsibility. It's making falls everybody's responsibility. So when we talk about intentional rounding, and we know the tool's only an assurance tool, that we could fill it in. So senior nurses could fill it in. But also, why can't the doctors, OTs, therapists, when they're dealing with the patients, complete the form and make sure that the patient's safe and has got all the belongings around them? So... Has there been any research that anyone's aware of around this? That's I'm not sure that needs research. You know, that needs, you know, finding the things Culture. to influence your teams, doesn't it? I do know some brilliant, but it's stereotyped to say they're geriatricians, you know, who insist their junior doctors ask people, do you want a drink, as they leave each ward round. You know, you do have... You know, ways people can work in that way, you know, but I, I would challenge it. I don't think it needs research, you know, I think it needs it's getting people change. in a darkened room for an hour, you know, because in principle they'll agree they all should do it. It just somehow disappears and becomes someone else's job once, uh, you know, the routine takes over again. I just, it's interesting that because I know I was bringing Sue in actually, who um, has done her doctorate in rounding, so over here, and um, I think it's really important because I know some of it very really from some of our elderly care wards and certainly our stroke ward where we have a really big multi professional multidisciplinary team and, and very often what we were finding was the documentation when they'd had um, quite intense intervention from a therapist and you often find this when you're looking at a complaint and you find there's no documentation for that period either because the patient 
was off the ward or actually because they were having therapy by the bed etc so I know that we've done some quite a bit of work on that to say that you know to work as a team to say well the people to fill this documentation it's not just a nursing duty because it is very hard often you find the patient has moved has been up and mobile has been out of the bed but a family might think they haven't been and not realize that the physio or the OT intervention actually you know sort of fulfilled that part of their care plan but there's no documentation so I take your point yeah. actually. Sue, so I think from your yeah, perspective. I, I think with um, rounding um, you have to be very clear that if you want it to prevent falls there has to be actions in the rounding process to prevent falls and um, as part of the research I did we observed rounding and in a lot of instances there wasn't any interaction with the patient or any intervention which would have prevented falls. It was more of a, a social conversation about um, is the patient okay? So if the patient was asked, um, are you okay? And that was seen as rounding. So, but there was nothing around fall prevention um, happening. Which is some really, some really interesting, um, and some of the things you get anecdotes as well, but information where we had um, a, a lady who'd been given some really bad news that she was dying, and um, she hadn't long been given this news. She was sat in a bed with uh, somebody uh, close to her, sat next to her, and this bright young nurse came whizzing past and said, um, have you got any worries and fears? Are you feeling all right? I was ticking the box, and she'd just been told that you know, that her care was palliative and it was nobody, that wasn't done on purpose, it wasn't done, anybody was bad or malicious, but it probably showed our attitude to it, a tick box mentality rather than thinking about what we were doing. Any other questions? Hello, um, I'm Fiona Wilson, I work in the Children's Hospital as one of the clinical educators but I'm also the moving and handling coordinator um, and I was just thinking about the bit that you said about um, having a very structured falls care plan and I was wondering how we could actually change that um, and if you've got any tools that we could use that might make us think a bit differently in that way. I think it is very difficult for children, isn't it? But I mean, I think you have the very similar challenge because I suspect around half of your inpatients are not well children with a acute illness. They are children with multiple physical mental health conditions. You, so I, the basic principles seem the same, but I guess you have the challenge that actually falling is part of development and learning to walk and, and growing. And, and that raises, you know, perhaps some learning for other Areas, you know, because if it's normal for a toddler to learn by bumps and bruises, you know, somehow we don't see that the same in rehab, you know, partly because the bumps and bruises are in more fragile bones. It's certainly been a long challenge. Julie might be able to help, but I don't think there's any real uh, research evidence. You know, it will be the wisdom of your peers, and I suspect what you've done will be as valuable to them as, as vice versa. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Fiona, a statistician from Manchester University. You talked about underreporting. We're about to embark, hopefully, on a study using the HSCIC HES data, hospital episode statistics. Have you any evidence of how much underreporting goes on with that data? Because we intend to use that. We, we can estimate it for pressure ulcers because people have done a skin survey and we can sort of cut across a bit by how much pressure ulcers were underreported and whether the number of reported pressure ulcers matched hairs. Generally speaking, hairs is not very good at recording anything that doesn't result in injury. There are research studies whereby actually unlike almost anything else in clinical care, there's more likely to be an incident report for a fall than something written in the notes. Um, so it, it probably isn't great. Um, but again, Anna Barker's studies has done a lot of, you know, of asking the patient, asking the staff, looking at incident forms, what do you think you're missing? But no, and, and HES doesn't separate admitted with fall from fall we don't have present on admission codes yet. Could you use the second episode, though? I suspect you know more, yeah. more about that than, than I do, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, 
got the back. Come on, Tim. You were at the stairs. I haven't got a back leg. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Oh, <laughs> Hi, I'm Andy. I'm a physiotherapist at an intermediate care unit in Trafford. I was just wondering, has anyone looked into like nutrition and the effects that it has? Just because obviously as a physio, I'm looking to build muscle, build strength. But the type of things that they eat doesn't really go with muscle building. It's toast, biscuits, mm-hmm. and pro- actually like linked into the caffeine as well. I'm pretty sure there will be studies in the community. Um, I've always been quite narrow vision in that mastering the evidence for hospitals has has been hard enough for me without the much greater wealth. But I think the problem, I suppose, is when there is so little exercise, almost your protein intake and the rest is almost irrelevant because you're doing nothing, uh, your, your muscle is wasting. Though I'm sure, you know, there is no doubt nutrition's an aspect of that. And vitamin D deficiency is very common uh, in the kind of inpatients we have who are housebound. I think there is quite a bit of evidence now uh, or being accumulated, isn't it, that um, actually hospital, because, well, they shouldn't be in hospital that long, that it isn't hospital food and diet. It's obviously how we keep patients out of hospital and keep them exercised. But I'm sure you're aware of that more than anybody. Um, but I think there's quite a lot going around keeping populations healthy and under- getting sort of particularly elderly people to build up some uh, body mass because of their risk of falls as well. It's, I'm not sure if it's going to the... Um, Chawton side of the community centre because they were doing some work there I think on exercise and clinics etc with the elderly as well There's some recent research as well that was showing that it doesn't have to be strenuous exercise it's just stretching can actually have the same kind of impact and, and it's different, again, you know, in terms of how much we actually make ourselves age healthily through general exercise, and once we're frail, the, the community strength and balance emphasis to reduce falls risk. Okay, any other questions? Oh, we'll go back there, too. <laughs> 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 He'll be fine. He'll be fine. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Nicola. I'm one of the orthoptists from the Eye Hospital here. Um, you mentioned there was a proportion of patients with visual impairment. I just wondered if that was solely patients with reduced visual acuity or whether it included patients with peripheral vision loss um, or double vision even, because I think sometimes that's something that's that can be overlooked. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have some input in the st- stroke ward here. Um, we have an orthoptist who goes over and assesses patients who are referred to us, but Generally, I'm, I'm not sure that those things are always included. No, no, it's sort of, if, if you go into any of the 4Z learning that I pointed out, you know, all the effects of the different sorts of visual impairment, but it is pretty much what you'd expect for a population in their 80s and 90s. So I think cataracts come up highest, but, you know, everything you'd expect in, in terms of macular degeneration, all, all the things that in different ways affect our eyesight, you know, and definitely the cognitive impairment, the fact that your eyes are still working, but your brain can't actually process that information and, and doesn't know what it's missing uh, the whole range sadly okay. uh, yeah um, Royal College of Royal College of Physicians Fall Safe will get you most of the downloadable resources all of them are free all of them are open access the e-learning um, it depends what platform your trust use whether you can automatically get on it Yep. Um, and well, anyone from well, another we, trust, we'll it, it's free to any NHS email. It might just be you have to email to get a login if your trust doesn't routinely. What we'll do is we'll email Francis slides and we'll also put the um, email address on that okay. for people and you can access it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Emma Stanmore from the University of Manchester. Um, I just wanted to add to that point that obviously like you, we've been working in research uh, researching falls for many years and one of the issues is there's such reams of evidence, there's 30 years of evidence to try and unravel. Um, so as well as those resources, the profound website mm. is, has um, fact sheets, the very short eight mm. or so fact sheets um, on everything that you can, you know, simple measures that you can do to prevent falls. So say one on environment or so on. So if you just go on profound.eu, 
um, people can find some good resources there. It's a really good thing to say because I will be absolutely useless. All my links will be about hospital falls prevention and the very feeble amount of research there compared with community. So, good point. Okay, Chris, is there anything you'd like to add before we close? <laughs> I just want, well, I wasn't expecting that, but thanks for a brilliant talk, really interesting. Of course, we do lots of work in the community and the community comes into the hospital and goes back into the community. Yeah, and I think that the one thing I would want us also to talk about is the maintenance of strength and balance or the improvement of strength and balance yeah. amongst people who've come out of the community into the yeah. hospital and then we're sending them home. Yeah. And that's one of the other issues that we haven't talked about yeah. other than to say we make people far too immobile while they're in hospital. Yeah. You're absolutely be, yeah. right, Chris, you know, and I think it's also that, that virtuous circle, because actually if we spot a vision problem in hospital, you know, that can be fixed not only to have a better life at home, but for the future admission. If there's strength and balance training, you know, once they're over their acute illness, they're much better equipped for a, a future acute illness. You yeah, absolutely, and, and apologize for not mentioning, you know, our, our patients, you know, are not living in hospital. They are swapping between the two environments constantly. Yeah. I think um, before we just say thanks again to Francis, there's a few things I'll take away from this, and this is about, about reinforcing the idea of the tick box mentality and some of the um, tick boxes that we use to try and decide are they at risk, are they not at risk, and then perhaps don't follow up with the interventions we need afterwards, after we've done the assessments. The other one is that we don't have, that we're absolutely right, we don't have patients very long, but actually, can you imagine if all the resources we spend on trying to reduce falls in hospital, all the one-to-one -one cares, the specials, we don't quite know what to do, we think people are confused. If we were able to get patients home quicker, and actually, as we move forward into the sort of new models of care that we're looking at in Manchester for our local um, care organisation, moving patients a lot quicker into the community, if that resource was moved into the community and spent much more on things like um, people, elder people doing exercises, stress, building muscle strength, and what a fitter and healthier um, society we would have then, particularly for elderly people, but just remembering that falls don't just happen to the elderly. So I'd like to take this occasion now just to say thank you once more to Francis. Thank you. Thank you. And just to remind you that these are the, what we call Florence Nightingale uh, supported uh, foundation lectures. And some of that is really about supporting nursing research. So if any of you at the end of this go away inspired and think that there's something that you'd like to do, that re or it's really inspired you to think about doing some research, then please can you make contact either with Sue or myself um, or the other Sue, the both Sues are down here, or any of your colleagues at the university and we'll point you in the right direction. I've got colleagues in the audience who will also, Nikki in terms of her expertise, Helen at the back there in terms of the, work, the research that she's doing. So if any of you think at the end of this you're inspired to think you want to do something, please don't just stick there and then forget about it and go home and have your tea. Have a think about it, come back and talk to some of us because we'd like to support you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.